to our series, Behind Every Great Cook is a Great Mother. I'd like to introduce our host, John Ota, who's a member of the Culinary Historians of Canada, and he is the author of the best-selling book, The Kitchen. Thank you, Julia. Our guest today is Julian Armstrong. Few Canadian writers know more than veteran reporter and cookbook author Julian Armstrong about Quebec food. She's been reporting on food for newspapers for the better part of five decades and was food editor of the Montreal Star and then the Montreal Gazette. She is the author of Made in Quebec, A Culinary Journey and A Taste of Quebec. She holds multiple culinary honors and has judged countless chefs contests and cookbook competitions. Julian was born in Toronto and holds a history degree from the University of Toronto. She moved to Montreal for love and embraced her adopted province, traveling along its back roads and discovering its regional cuisines. In fall 2019, Julian Armstrong was inducted as an honorary lifetime member of the Culinary Historians of Canada. Julian, can you please tell us about your mother? Did she like to cook? Did she have an impact on your cooking career? My mother grew up in a very large house in Toronto that had staff and there was a cook. And I don't think any of the people, of the members of the family went into the kitchen except marmalade making time or red pepper pickle time. And then there seemed to be a gathering in the kitchen and I have those recipes from that era, which was before the Great War. And uh, I still use them. They're good solid recipes. My mother's equipment I've inherited. There is an enormous preserving kettle. I think it's copper with tin on top. I'm sure it's hazardous. I don't use it anymore. You could bathe a little puppy in it. It's quite big. <laughs> and I also have her orange cutter because in the old days, the Seville oranges, which are so important for good marmalade, came in from Spain by boat. They took months to arrive, and when they got here, they were dry and wizened, and you needed a serious cutter. Now they're grown in Arizona, and they're soft and easy to do with a knife. But this, this cutter, it looks like a little guillotine. I was always quite frightened of it. You fasten it to the edge of the kitchen table, and you turn this huge menacing knife. And if you get that orange too close, it takes some of you with it. So. I don't use it anymore. I just have it as a conversation piece. The red pepper pickle was much easier. I think we just chopped it up with knives. What was it like in your kitchen? I grew up in the annex in Toronto on Elgin Avenue. We had a huge kitchen in the back. I think there was a little wood stove in one corner. This was not a fancy, tarted up, renovated house. It was a real old Victorian pile. And uh, there was a central kitchen table on which my mother wrote her cooking columns. And she had an old Smith Corona typewriter. And my picture of her in that kitchen is of an evening sitting banging out her column on the Smith Corona. She would have pushed all her community work papers to one side and she would be getting her column done, which was published in Saturday Night Magazine. And then the Globe and Mail started a women's section. And she wrote once a month for the Globe and Mail as well. She wasn't what I've been, a standard food news reporter. She wrote about the lore of cooking, the appreciation of food, the, the sociological aspects to it. It was a good story. What name did she write under? I'd love to look up some Janet of them. March. It was an era when ladies didn't reveal that they were working for money. You know that old time? I had an aunt who wrote of Cynthia Brown, same reason. So you grew up in this kind of food writing milieu. I, I guess you could call it that. When I moved to Montreal as a new bride, I took a cooking course from the nuns. Everybody went to the nuns. It was a, a, a school uh, right in the middle of town on Stanley Street, and I learned the basics. Mama taught us the absolute basics. I could already make white sauce, you know, the basics. And uh, the, the uh, managing editor of the Gazette, where I was just a regular women's news reporter, heard about this. And he said, we're going to start a food section. Would you like to run it? And I thought, oh my lordy, how could I do that? And then I remembered mom sitting at the kitchen table, bringing up children, running the community, having a good time. And I knew my husband and I wanted to have children. So I thought, I'll say, okay. And I did. 
And that led me into the food writing world. And I kept it on after I did leave the paper and went home. I've actually never stopped. What did you find about Quebec food at that point in time? Well, there were two kinds of Quebec food when I moved to the, to the province. I see. The, the major restaurants and hotels in Montreal all had French chefs from France. It was very classic. It was quite elaborate. But if you got out in the country, you got the tortier and the sea pie and the sugar pie mm -hmm. and the ragu and, and sort of basic family stuff, which is very precious to the, the, the French Canadian cook and family. It's still there. You find in Quebec, even now, in the month of December, the good restaurants with good chefs will produce their mother's tortier. Of course, it'll be tarted up a bit. It'll be a little fancier than it was when their mother or their grandmother or their great-grandmother did it. But it will be on the menu, and so will pea soup, mm -hmm. and so will sugar pie. Some of those basics will turn up, but made a little more lighter and a little fancier and a little prettier. I mean, they didn't come from a cauldron on the hearth, you know, they came from the best stove you can buy in the chef's kitchen. So it was a little easier to make them look prettier. Yeah. So when you were starting off like that, what kind of columns would you write? Did you write about the city food or did you write about the, uh, the country food? I wrote about every, uh, initially I wrote about everything that was going, nutrition, the automation of supermarkets, uh, food scares, uh, additives. Oh my goodness, we've got additives. You know, they were considered to be almost like poison at one time. Now I think they make us able to keep our food uh, for longer. But anyway, uh, I wrote about everything. And then the paper, the Gazette had quite a lot of money at one time. And they sent a bunch of us up to Jean Pierre in northern Quebec to do a, a French immersion course one summer. We were up there for three weeks. I think there were about a dozen of us. And I ran into another kind of family cooking in the Saguenay, which is a very remote region of Quebec and has the original cuisine not changed much over the years. And everybody eats it at home all the time. And I came back to the office and I remember I was feeling quite feisty that day. And I went into my editor and I said, you are going to pay to send me all over this province and trace <laughs> what happened to the original dishes that came in 1608 with the settlers, and then they moved to the different regions and what happened to those dishes. And you know, they did. They did do that. For two mm -hmm. years, they funded me to travel the province. I would do about one trip every six weeks. And that was the basis of my first book, A Taste of Quebec. For instance, up the St. Maurice, Maurice River, north of Three Rivers, the tertiaire was made with salmon. It was a salmon river. Mm -hmm. Down in the Gas Bay, where there'd always been Scottish and English and Irish fishermen who would have come. There's oats in the torch air. Oats? What's that? That's not a Quebec dish, but it's, it's still true today. The thing I was so fascinated with when I started doing this series, uh, my French re reporter friends, food writers, would come up to me. They were from different regions of Quebec, all working out of Montreal, and they would say, I never knew that about our dishes. I never knew that's why they're made that way. They had been sitting on this story their whole lives, and I had seen it as a story. So, and they always were delighted. For instance, I have a good friend who unfortunately just died, who worked for the Journal de Montréal, our great big tabloid. She came from the Saguenay, and I have her recipes for, in my book. She gave me a couple of recipes, and the, the tortier up in the Saguenay is quite different from the tortier everywhere else. And she was a godsend to me, and she was saying, I could have been writing this stuff. So I, I was amused by that <laughs> and rewarded by it. Uh, your latest book, Made in Quebec, A Culinary Journey. How did you get inspired to do that book? Well, I had had the other book revised in 2001. And I was aware, because I was continuing to cover food the whole time, that a lot of new things were happening. New vegetables were being grown, new meats, poultry, uh, the raising of uh, meat animals was going on. The chefs were better trained. Uh, there was more of an interest in uh, nouvelle cuisine, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I knew there was new material for a new book. And uh, the, the new book has been fun to do because I, I had to put in 
what's happened to the tortier. I had to put in what's happened to pea soup. I have a marvelous maple syrup pie. Uh, that had to be in there too, but there were a lot of new recipes using the new foods, the new vegetables, the new meats, the new fish. And I got an absolutely superb photographer based in Toronto, yeah. Ryan Sulk, who is just a godsend to food photography. He made everything look as if it tasted good. You've made a lot of culinary discoveries in Quebec. And I was wondering, what are some of your favorites? Well, I, I remember visiting the island off Bay St. Paul, which has a, an unusual kind of a tortier mixture called a pate croche. It looks like a big, big turnover. And it's got a twisted, uh, a, a, an effect of twisted rope around the outside. And the, the tortier mixture is inside that. And that is traditional to that island, Il Ocoud. Mm. And what else? Chausson pom, which is just a peeled apple covered with pastry and baked. Terrific. Found it there. Love that. I love the app. I guess my, the, greatest, the greatest testing effort of my entire career was the maple syrup pie. That oh, was a killer. Because the one I, I endorse, which is the best maple syrup, syrup pie in the world, initiated in Freiligsburg in the eastern townships of Quebec. And the chef would not give me the recipe for the paper, eh? So I hunted around and I hunted around and I adapted one. I think I used one of Elizabeth Baird's backwoods pie or something as one of my inspirations. And I ran the recipe. And did I get a flood of mail? This is not exactly right. The problem with that pie is all it has as the filling is maple syrup, little brown sugar, some butter, no thickener. Uh, readers at the cassette would phone and say, I loved it, but I've had to buy a new can of, of oven cleaner. You know, it ran all over my oven. <laughs> And every couple of years, I would entice a new pastry chef to try it and get it to work better. And then I get the same kind of response. I'm still buying oven cleaner, Miss Armstrong. Can you help me? I love the flavor. But, well, when I did the new book, Made in Quebec, I was smart, finally. I got a super recipe tester, and she figured out how to do it. And the one in the book works. It won't dirty your oven. It, it'll stay this lovely golden jellied interior to the pie and it tastes divine. When I heard you speak here in Toronto, you said that dinner out in Montreal is different from other places. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What's it like to go out to dinner in Montreal? Well, I think you, it goes back to the fact that the, the French speaking Quebecer thinks food is very important. And you would, you would rarely, if ever, hear anybody in Montreal saying, let's do a movie and then we'll grab dinner. That does not happen. Dinner is the evening. Dinner is the entertainment. You sit over another bottle of good wine. Oh, let's start with, let's have the tasting menu, which is seven little tiny lovely things making up dinner. It's just a, a total appreciation about the importance of food. And that, that's the difference. And the other thing I found here, living here as long as I have, is that they're brave. They're so brave. My last big food story in the Gazette before I went off and just did columns was about a woman up near Joliet who's growing saffron. Saffron. She had some land up there and she planted saffron, which uh, ripens or whatever in the fall. I don't think you'd find that in... Uh, what, Uxbridge? I don't think you find that total optimism, total fascination with food and ability to really put your back into it and do it. What are some of the food trends that are happening in Quebec right now, would you say? Well, I hate to say it. Yeah. But there are some vegan restaurants. <laughs> and I have gotten a little tired of vegan I think to be on a vegan diet and to be healthy, you have to be very, very careful and you have to do a lot of home cooking or have some minion out in the kitchen doing it for you. One fascinating thing I've noticed is the advancement of women. Uh, most pastry chefs in the good restaurants are women. You know, the, the, they just have a flair for it. Um, Julia, 
Are there any uh, questions from the audience? Yes, we do have a few. And um, the first one is, when you were traveling to discover the roots of some of these dishes, um, how did you approach it? Did you go to restaurants? Did you eat with families? Did you find home cooks to talk to? I used to get on the phone. That was, it was when I first started, it was before email was such a useful tool for research, but I would get on the phone and I would know somebody who lived in a region. Or I, if I was completely desperate, I would call a tourist office and I'd say, when you go out to dinner, where do you go out to dinner? And I would start with a name and that would lead me to another name so that before I ever got in my car with my cooler and usually a willing travel companion who was tolerant, it was often my mother initially, and then my sister and my children have all helped. They've all eaten untested recipes. They still remember a certain uh, blue, blue plum tor tort that they had to say they set, had to have five nights running. I can't believe that I did that to them. But anyway, so I would have these names <laughs> in a region and I would phone them. And then I would find out the good shops for, for instance, getting good cheese. I would drop in there. They would obviously know some chefs, which are the best restaurants. It was all kind of a treasure hunt. And it led, one name led to another. Wow, and uh, awesome. it always paid off. That's I'll so confess great. to you, there's one region I've never been to uh, in the Abitibi, up north of Montreal, Val d'Or area, but I had a spy go for me. Another question, you mentioned earlier on that uh, when, when you moved to Quebec, one took lessons or learned cooking from the, the sisters, the nuns. Mm -hmm. um, are, did you visit any of them and get some uh, ancient recipes that had come from their yes. predecessors? Yeah, the, or the uh, congregation of Notre Dame were absolutely invaluable. There was a famous nun who was my teacher when I was first married, Sorbert. And she had a colleague, Sir Monique. Between those two nuns, they knew a whole lot. And they also had the history. They were very concerned about the history. Sir Monique's order had written Quebec's original best-selling cookbook called La Cuisine Raisonnée, which is still coming out. And every self-respecting girl getting married in Quebec had a copy of La Cuisine Raisonnée as a wedding gift. So they were a huge help particularly with the traditional recipes. Sorbert always took credit for any publicity I got. She said, she was my student, I taught her. She was a tough little nun and uh, I really loved that lady. <laughs> I'm sorry some of them have gone, you know, they're, they're, I can't call them anymore. This is another aspect that I'd love to mention is Jean Benoit, who maybe mm. you know about or her reputation. She used to take us food writers aside and say, get to the women who cook without a recipe and get to them quickly and write it down. We're going to lose that cuisine. Hmm. And uh, she was always full of praise if I ever had a story in the paper that interviewed an, an older lady who just did it by rote, you know, who, who knew how much salt to add. And so I think that's still true. There are still, and especially now in today's world, with so many people who come to Canada from other countries, they don't usually use a recipe book. They do it by rote. So we should, we writers should get close to them and catch this cuisine before everybody forgets it. That's fascinating. And um, another question we have is about whether or not you have noticed any changes in food journalism. So your, your mother, uh, wrote a certain way, you approached it in a certain way. What changes have you seen throughout your career and what are you seeing now? Well, I'm thinking of the way food uh, stories are relayed to the public. There are so many beautiful magazines and books with gorgeous pictures. And then there are television shows and chef's contests. It's become, in a sense, entertainment. And I just hope people are still turning out dinner for the kids and not just phoning out. That's my concern. Uh, there is a lot of takeout, as I'm sure you know. And another trend that I think is helpful to the home cook is these partially prepared products that we can buy, like the, the salads chopped up, the cabbages chopped up, 
the ingredients have improved a great deal. I think we know more about different kinds of fish. Uh, in Quebec, we have a wonderful pork that was produced called uh, Gaspar pork by two guys who decided to try and feed the little piglets differently and produced a slightly bigger animal than a piglet with more meat on it and a wonderful flavor. It's as expensive in a Montreal restaurant as filet mignon, but it's delicious. So there are a lot of developments just coming out of the food industry and the food uh, production part of the industry. And uh, those are being prepared by the young chefs who are better trained than they ever were. So there's lots going on. Wow. Maybe I should write another book. Oh. Um, did your children enjoy learning to cook when they were young? And, and um, did you, how did you teach them? And what, what advice do you well, have for families today when they're teaching kids? I think it's important to teach them. Uh, I remember my, my girl, I have twin daughters who are now in their 50s. And when they were uh, young and teenagers, and uh, they would bring friends over to my house. And that would be the only meal the kid had that wasn't out of a box or a telephone order. They, they liked home cooking. And my kids can all cook. Uh, well, my girls are better than my son. But I mean, that's natural. Eh? They, don't, they don't pay as much attention, or most of them don't. But um, my girls cook some of my favorites. Uh, they actually have become a little bit interfering uh, because they really tackle all the new vegetables and know how to deal with them. And I think, oh, let's just have broccoli, you know? <laughs> and they say, no, mom, broccolini. <laughs> <laughs> and what would they consider um, a comfort food dish from their childhood? And what would you consider a comfort food dish from your childhood? Once my mother learned how to cook, uh, when she married my father, he always said that she served him a half grapefruit for dessert every night for two years. I can't believe that's true. I think he was teasing her. But she went to a school in Toronto called Central Tech, which was, uh, a, 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 well, a, a vocational school, I think, and it had a, a, a course for amateurs. And she became a very good cook as far as things like a stews and uh, one recipe that maybe is uh, uh, become a basic in our family, we call Italian. That's all we call it. And it came from Mary Millichamp's restaurant on Yorkville Avenue, which was published in the Globe and Mail in the 50s. And it was, it was just a, a um, tomato meat sauce that went on spaghetti. And for some reason, mother always called it Italian. And all three of us, can, my brother, my sister, and I all, can all make it and all my kids can make it. It's just a simple thing. But I think a recipe, if it's served several times and it's good, it just becomes a family favorite. Another one that mom did very well was a stuffed pork tenderloin. And mm. uh, I've noticed how reasonably priced that cut of meat is in the stores. And you slit it open and you put a bread stuffing in, maybe lay some bacon on top, uh, roast for an hour, bingo. I've tarted it up sometimes when I published it with a mushroom sauce, but you don't need the mushroom sauce. Uh, I, I think comfort food is usually pretty relaxed to eat and probably quite easy to make. And don't you notice how, how popular mashed potatoes are when you're at anywhere and you, they're served? Uh, they're, uh, they're sort of comforting. Mm -hmm. I have a, a mashed potato recipe I got, I think, from a combination of Elizabeth Baird, Rosemary, and Monda Rosenberg. They do different, they add different things to that mixture, but I think it's Rose that puts chopped celery in the mixture. And I make that, uh, you can make it two days ahead and reheat it when you're having Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. Delicious. Mm. Well, that, it has been uh, a pleasure to uh, speak with my namesake and uh, ask you all these questions and I'm gonna pass it back to John now. Thank you, Julia. On behalf of Julia Armstrong, our Zoom producer, and Sarah Hood, our video producer, and the Culinary Historians of Canada, I'd like to thank Julian Armstrong, yay, for joining us today <laughs> and sharing thoughts and sentiments about her mother with us and telling us about the magic of Quebec food. And thank you for joining us for Behind Every Great Chef is a Great Mother. In the meantime, please stay well, 
and happy cooking. Thank you.